All right, boys. So this is my big idea. Uh, so for a while, uh, we were doing like super max stuff, like Cal Dietz kind of triphasic. And then we started going more like, uh, more like DAC, like pin press and stuff like that. And then uh, the other day I was literally listening to this podcast uh, like, and they were talking about how tendons didn't our tendons lengthen and muscles don't and this has been like the fifth or sixth time that i heard that and i was like okay like I, i've never really understood it because like the musculotendinous unit like that definitely lengthens and so if the muscle itself doesn't lengthen like that has some pretty big complications like during the stretch shortening cycle if it doesn't lengthen then like i've got like to do something about that because i don't want to train the same so because I don't really give a shit, like if I'm in the stretch shortening cycle and my muscle doesn't lengthen, then during like pitching delivery, it's also not going to lengthen. So like a uh, classic study is like the vertical jump versus the non-counter movement vertical jump. Like you're going down, like you're able to gather a bunch of energy and then go up. Like that's why you can jump higher in these like athletic movements because you're allowing your tendons to lengthen, harness elastic energy and then move on. And so I was like, okay, so this has pretty big complications for how I've been lifting. I definitely haven't been lifting in a way that reflects like efficiency of the stretch shortening cycle, because I think we can all agree that like more elite athletes use the stretch shortening cycle more efficiently than non elite athletes. And so I was like, all right, let's, let's look into this. So I started looking at studies and I was literally on a, on a flight and I pulled up like 15 or 20 studies. and I was just reading them all flight. And I sent stuff to Mason for like two hours. And then this is what came out of it. And so well, here's what I'm going to talk about four main points today. Muscles don't lengthen. Uh, it's just a pre-tensioning for concentric movement during an eccentric part of a lift. Uh, we overtrain mid ranges of muscle action. And so uh, Mason's probably going to talk about this more than me, but middle ranges are overtrained in pitchers because we want them to be pitchers and we don't want them to train elite ranges of motion, even though they access that in the delivery. Like right now, the, the phase is, uh, like back bridges and like thoracic extension. That's everybody's favorite thing to talk about right now. And it's the spinal engine. But like, you need to be training your entire body like that. No one does like a pretty elite side bend and then posts it on Instagram, but you should be doing that. And then uh, the optimal zone of lengthening. So this kind of plays off the mid ranges. So the optimal zone of lengthening is like how much the actin and myosin threads in the sarcomere like overlap. And so in the weakest areas is where the most athletic movement is going to happen. So like uh, during the pitching, like your abdominals, like optimal zone of lengthening is really, really short. Uh, but most of your like energy transfer is going to happen when it's really, really lengthened. And so we need to train for that. And then uh, I've just got some example exercises I've been playing around with like the past week. That'll be the last thing we'll talk about. And so can you guys see the right part of my screen or is it cut off? Yeah. Yeah. No, we should. Right. I see it. Okay. Well, then I just need to move this. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, this first study. And so this was by Walker Owen. Uh, he, this is kind of a systematic review of the of this uh, article, uh, the stress shortening cycle on sports for science. And so I highlighted two main sentences out of the whole article, which kind of gives you an idea. But uh, the muscle then remains contracted and stiff during the first two processes of the stress shortening cycle the eccentric and amortization phases. And so that's just eccentric and isometric in order to transmit the isometric force into the tendon. All right, that makes sense. I can't be like, the muscle must like remain stiff. So there's a pre-tensioning occurring in the muscle so you can transfer energy. That makes sense because like if you have a shitty lead leg and your leg isn't braced to go on the ground, you're just gonna fall up. Like that, that checks out. And so during the concentric phase of the stretch shortening cycle, often referred to as the positive acceleration phase, the muscle is then able to concentrically contract and provide additional propulsive force. Okay, so what does that mean? So the muscle has to contract concentrically during the eccentric phase to stiffen, so it slightly contracts concentrically, and then the tendon lengthens itself. That was the conclusion that I drew from that. And I don't know if that's fair or unfair, but basically, like, I, I want my athletes to train these tendons to lengthen. And so I wanna place heavy eccentric loads on their body. And then I want them to convert it to concentric energy quickly. And so uh, the stretch shortening cycle is largely tendon training. 
And so that's important for transfer of elastic energy like we previously talked about. And so uh, how am I gonna train this? Well, the most efficient exercise is definitely sprinting. And that's the best exercise for lower body, like stress shortening cycle training. It's the most athletic exercise you can ever do. And uh, there's really no, everything that we do in the weight room is just pretty much to mimic sprinting, I would say. Um, but we can't, we, we don't train that way very often as baseball players, which is weird. Um, it's always like uh, bench press, like for some weight, like squat for some weight. It's never like any sort of extreme exercise. And it's never as heavy as you can go. Like if you back squat 500 pounds, like that's not, that's not the maximum amount of output that you can possibly create. You're just exhibiting failure in a back squat pattern. Like the reason why you're dead after is because you're technical failure, not because that's the most your legs could probably lift, I'd say. And so there are also two types of the stretch shortening cycle. There's fast and slow stretch shortening cycle. So fast is ground contact times under 250 milliseconds, and then slow is over 250 milliseconds. And so the, the sprinting is going to take care of that first part. And so what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to take care of the slow part. And so that's stuff like fast jogging, I'd say, like, or because, you know, not everything happens in an instant in the pitching delivery. Uh, there's definitely parts where you're going to be moving fast. And then, but there's stuff like the time where you're on your back leg, where that's definitely longer than 250 milliseconds. So we're going to want to be good at that as well. Mason, you got anything? No, that was a good point at the end. Uh, the back leg, like, is a little different than the upper half in the delivery. Yeah. And so there's room for both. Uh, it's never just like, we just want to go all the way to the end. It's like, no, I want to be good at both. And that's what I think a lot of people miss as well, because everyone gets on the sprinting train and then it's just like, well, I still want to do like some other stuff. Like if I'm good at sprinting, I'm not necessarily going to throw hard, but it helps. I got something on sprinting before you continue. For sure. So like, what's your take on like getting the most out of sprinting without like a flying 10 unit or like something that actually measures it? Because I feel like it's like the same thing as throwing without a radar gun. And like, I, I, like, what do you try to do to simulate that to like get the max output if you're just sprinting in a field and you don't have any type of like measurement? Um, so what I would do in that scenario is I'm a big fan of this. I'd go like downhill sprints. And so like slightly, super slight downhill uh, because even if the athlete isn't like, you know, super bought in to that, they're still going to get some effects from overspeed. And so that'll help train the nervous system. So like, uh, because, like this, probably like not too crazy, but just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, literally just a little bit. And so what that's going to do is even if like, okay, like I'm a super like uh, dopamine uh, lacking guy, like I need to get it up for like five, below, like I need to scream, like whatever. Um, and that's okay. So like, I, if I don't have a tracking unit, like I'm probably not going to run as fast as I can on a regular sprint. Like that's a big issue. Yeah. And so I'm just going to tell guys to go run slightly downhill and that'll help like get them up to like close to max speed. And that'll still help us get some good adaptations. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the other thing I try to do is if you have someone to train with race, literally like any kind of races or competition will help you fa get faster. So. Yeah. And then, I mean, also as a phone stopwatch, you could do like five or six sprints and then average them and then track time to time. Just some. Ugh. All right. Well, I'll move on to pretensioning. And so, uh, therefore, like the pretension before the stretch shortening cycle is pretty important. Um, it's literally just the slight contraction, uh, the concentric contraction, uh, in order to like prepare your muscle for energy transfer. And so, uh, it just like so if you're relaxed, like your muscles are slack, and then when you tighten and pretension, uh it basically just makes it like a taut string and it lengthens the tendons very slightly. And so like, that's why a lot of guys throw harder out of the old school windup because the movement of the arms over the head, like that just pretensions the muscle in the arms and it allows them to use like the downward swing and momentum capture. And, but I mean, that's one of the reasons. And so this ability to store elastic energy during this pretension is paramount to athletic performance. Like elite sprinters are able to pretension better and use less range of motion than like me because they can store more energy quicker 
And so like guys who have a really elite vertical jump, if you watch their vertical jump videos, they won't go down as far and then go up. They're way better at being able to pre-tension and store energy quickly and then go up. And so, yeah, non-counter movement versus counter movement jump. Same thing. You can't really pre-tension if you're just stuck. You need to go down and harness some energy and then go up. And so you can see on the diagram on the left, uh, this is the tricep soiree muscle group. And this person is readying for toe off in the uh, uh, in a vertical jump. And the muscle is slack furthest to the left. And then it tensions out before toe off. And it like becomes taut. And then they jump up. So it's just uh, schematics. But so this enables energy transfers I previously talked about. And so uh, this is another study uh, from Kimwaki Kubo. And then I can't say our last name, but that's okay. And uh, these three sentences kind of showed me that uh, coordination is a huge limiter of these qualities because uh, it is well known if an activated muscle is stretched before shortening, its performance is enhanced during the uh, concentric phase. And I mean, everybody kind of knows that uh, if you don't jump higher on a regular vertical jump, you definitely need to work on like your efficiency in the stress shortening cycle. And then uh, the present results would strongly be associated with tendon structures, not with muscle fiber composition. This is probably the most important, important sentence in this entire study. Muscle composition may not be the difference between the people that jump high out of a vertical jump than others. That is huge. That, that implies coordination and, and uh, elastic energy uh, transfer because both of those kind of go hand in hand. If you can store and release more elastic energy, you're going to probably do it in a more coordinated pattern than someone else. And so if, you're, if you believe that muscle composition doesn't have any impact on whether someone's jumping high or not, then why are you training it? Like it's not about like type two fibers. A lot of people love to talk about type two muscle fibers. It might not mean anything. I don't think it means anything. It literally, I think it has to do with people are better athletes because they move better. People are better athletes because their nervous system is able to fire and recruit more amount of muscle fibers. Additionally, uh, uh, Dr. Matt, Matt Lang, uh, is that who was on the baseball foreign summit, Mason? Um, uh, which study or which? The, the, the type one guy. I don't think I've yeah. watched that one yet. No, no, no. It's the third one. Um, what's his face? Oh, he talks, uh, John he talks about, thank you, John Waggle. John Waggle talks a lot about type one muscle fibers being of huge importance to starting pitchers. Like starting pitchers, elite starting pitchers are supposed to keep their like average heart rate around 83% of their max. So you're riding at like 150. And so you need to have a little bit of endurance. So at the end of the day, it might just be eyewash. Because you need, because pitchers, starting pitchers at least, are definitely a little bit endurance athletes. And so uh, we should target isometric and concentric training for pitchers. And yeah, I totally agree. Um, these, these qualities are going to be more important than anything else. I mean, a lot of people already hit concentric training, uh, but I don't think they do it in a way that makes it meaningful or they do it at end range enough. They, everybody loves a bench press, but that's just a mid range type scenario. I really don't care. I mean, I really care about like some elite range of motion, like super extended, the arms a little pronated, like that's great. Like that's, that's the type of exercise that we want. And then finally, um, it seems reasonable to suppose that the elastic properties of tendon structures considerably affect the differences in vertical jump height with and without counter movement. That just leads me back to the coordination is king. And so at the end of the day, eccentric load still does matter. I'm not saying that it doesn't, but I want athletes to practice absorbing a lot of weight really quickly, like in sprinting, like when that lead leg hits the ground, like that's going to be five or six times body weight, right? And so they're going to need to reabsorb that energy quickly and then redistribute it into concentric contraction immediately. Mason, you got anything? Yeah, I saw a recent example of this. Uh, a guy set like the clean and jerk world record. Um, they didn't count it because he didn't hold it for three seconds or whatever. But this guy was, I mean, he was a heavy guy, but he had like a big beer belly and, you know, he wasn't a muscular guy and he's clean and jerking like 500 something pounds which is just a testament to his coordination and power and like 
the fact that the my, the muscle uh, type really didn't matter that much, at least visually. So, but isn't building like that engine of strength and muscle like linked with coordination? I mean, so for sure, a little bit. And so when you're lifting, like we talked about this in one of our latest posts, like you're just displaying coordination and you're, and you're learning to produce force in coordinated movement patterns. But that's not to say that lifting is the only way that you could do that necessarily. Okay. Spring is a great way to do that. Jumping is another great way. Like you're just learning to express those movement patterns with terms that we've made up. We made up terms like force. We made up terms like speed. Like you're just expressing force and speed underneath a barbell and there are a lot of other ways you can learn to do that as well that makes sense i'm sure you've played with some of those guys like i've played with guys who have never touched the weight and come in you know deadlifting 400 plus pounds and it's like how can they do that how can they display that much force but i think the ability to coordinate their limbs and like make a pretty efficient deadlift on their first time trying it helps a lot so yeah i i definitely see that in pro ball way more than college right And then, so mid-range is your overtrained, and here's why. So I'm going to not train at mid-range for these six reasons that I, I mostly came up with. Um, but reciprocal inhibition. Uh, so if you train at maximum length, the opposite side of the muscle, the agonist muscle, uh, is going to be at its shortest. Um, and so this helps you recover because, um, you know, if one lengthens, it's going to be maximum. And then the others, if you're contracting maximally, then the other has to relax maximally. And so that's the same idea with the ISOs. Um, if you contract maximally during an ISO, the other half is going to relax maximally and you're going to go deeper and deeper into the ISO. And technically you should recover because you're not using those muscle groups. Okay. And then, so injuries uh, occur mostly in sport, in my opinion, because we don't train at mid range, at, at end ranges. Uh, most injuries happen. Like when you're trying to make a cut, and you ACL goes to the side. And a lot of force goes through there in a range that your body is not comfortable with. And so you're not going to be ready to absorb force there. And your force is going to go in a potentially weak muscles and tissues and fascia. And so you normally don't get hurt at something doing it in a mid range correctly for the thousandth time in a row. That's never how it goes. And then breathing. Um, this is going to be a very important thing that I think uh, a lot of people miss. And so athletes cannot get into positions if they can't breathe in them. Um, so uh, four in, eight out. Uh, if you can't do that, like in a back bridge, I know I definitely have trouble doing that. Um, I kind of breathe through my mouth a little bit or freak out and close my eyes and I like move. Um, you're not going to be able to access that range of motion in any sort of athletic move. And then limited proprioception. Um, uh, this is something that I've noticed super recently, um, but athletes who tend to have no idea where they are in space tend to uh, tend to have been hurt, especially in these extreme ranges of motion. Like for instance, uh, you can do a pretty simple test. So if you got like a buddy or something that's coming back from like a shoulder labrum injury, like you can roll up their shirt and then have them close their eyes and then touch on their body. And then they have to touch the same place. And like, you will see some weird stuff. Like I did it to Mason yesterday. And he was missing by like two inches. And that shows that Mason has no idea where his shoulder is in space. And so we want to get proprioception in these like pretty elite ranges uh, because I want you to control them. I want you to know uh, like where your body's in space. And because if you know where your body's in space and it's elite range of motion, let's just take football, for instance. Like I have you do like a cartwheel a bunch of times and you're really good at doing a cartwheel. Well, okay, maybe next time when your feet come out from under you and your head goes towards the ground, like you're going to have an idea of what's going on. Your monkey brain isn't going to flip out and just try to save you and sacrifice a limb. Like you might be okay. And that's just something that I don't think we do enough. And then this optimal zone. And so I already talked about this, but muscles are at their weakest, at their shortest or longest lengths, but they're trained where they're uh, strongest all the time. And that doesn't really make any sense to me. Like weightlifting, we should be working to level up the person as a human being. And so if we're working in ranges where we're our weakest, like we're going to level up all together. Like, I, cause I guarantee you, I, if 
everywhere was as strong as my, like the middle part of my bench. Like I could bench four plates, but I cannot. And so um, this just sounds backwards to me how we do it. And I think that needs to be reformed. And then elite athletes are also elite movers. And I want my athletes to be elite at moving through every single range of motion possible. Um, and so we started looking at Stefan Kranich. He's on Instagram, great follow. Uh, we actually bought one of his courses the other day. And so chances are everybody and their mother is fine moving through basic ranges of motion. Like that's not really like a task that I'm really worried about my athletes doing when they get to me, but can they move through extreme ROM? And then can they link these extreme ROM movements together? Like, can you go back bridge into a side bend? Like, can you side bend and back bridge at the same time? Like you might be good at one or the other, but can you do them together? Like in the pitching delivery, you can think about, there's a lot of side bending that turns into a thoracic extension. Like if you can't link one together, then what's the point? Yeah, I mean, to truly use the spinal engine, right? David Weck says you have to be able to rotate and side bend at the same time. But like most uh, rotational athletes we watch cannot do these well together. So I think that's a good point is actually training the movements together. Yeah. So you're saying that uh, we when we're doing like a back bridge or other stuff where we're getting into these like extreme ranges of motions, we should try to dabble with like like parasympathetic breathing patterns to see like if we can't do that then we can't tap into it during the motion like yes, why, why is that a thing i'm trying to figure well, that is that just some study or something uh no that's just what like okay if you can't relax into a position like with your just think about it if your musculature cannot relax to get you into position like you're not going to be able to hit it in athletic movement ever because you have yeah. to be relaxed in order to throw 95 and, and even, even if you do somehow hit it you're not going to be able to do it for long at all right yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, just think like if my abs won't release into this back bridge and I'm and like they just won't release, my back bridge isn't going to be very good. Okay. Now, during one of the most parasympathetic activities, pitching, like you're still going to need to be able to relax just a little bit. And so that's why like parasympathetic breathing patterns, like that's going to help ingrain it better because you're going to be able to do it in a relaxed state. So imagine what you're going to be able to do when you're in like some elite sort of position and imagine like you're separated 40 degrees like of hip shoulder separation and you're trying to like extend your back at the same time if you can't relax a little bit you're not going to be able to hit it and so that's what the parasympathetic breathing is it's going to get your nervous system used to being in that position and help you hit it yeah i think i'm going to dabble with that when i do <laughs> certain like yeah, when, I hit a, the, when I hit a back bridge later today. So what about when you're talking about the injuries and not training the end range? So like, are you saying that baseball players should train like close to their max external rotation if they can get there, like in some way of their shoulder? Mason. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty tricky question. Um, right now we would say no the premise is good, but like the inherent risks of it might kind of outweigh that. Um, yeah, it's a good discussion. We've been going back and forth on this one. So um, I would say, oh, uh, my bad, Chase. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah. I feel like there's, I don't know, because it's kind of almost going against, it's like there's inherent risk to it. It's like, well, then we shouldn't even be throwing. <laughs> That's true. But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, my thought process is, is I can teach a lot of those. So if, if that's my MO, I'm just going to throw more. Uh -huh. Like if I want to train super layback, I'm going to throw heavy ass stuff. Like so then that's going to be my MO. I might not target it in the weight room because then I can hit all these different positions on different exercises. And then I just like the best thing to teach about throwing is throwing. So, but then doesn't that go against like, why should we do a back bridge then if you're just going to hit it, you're going to hit something close to it while throwing. <laughs> well, but see, it really depends on where the athlete's at. Like if I get 170 degrees of, uh, of ER already, but I can't bend my thoracic spine for crap. Like I'm going to want to practice that. I might not yeah. necessarily need to practice more ER. Well, yeah. And you can, okay. It makes sense too. Cause you can do back bridge all day, but you can't just throw over and over again. Yeah. And, and then, so, I mean, I got this. 
you don't need that much uh, like actual ER at the shoulder joint. Like Liam Doolin, one of the guys we train, he cannot get his arm like vertical, but yet like he throws 98. Does it get, what about in slow motion video? Is it like laid back all the way? Like Uh, not laid back all the way. uh, It's not great, but like he's got some. He throws cheese, so it's fine. (laughs) Yeah, I got, I got, I got one. So talking about like the limited proprioception, like how would you guys go about addressing that and like increasing proprioception in your athletes? Like, yeah. would you, would you knock that out with just kind of like some DAC style, like high rep, like joint moves or like what, like what's your thought process behind that? Yeah. Um, so the thing that I talked about, like that's def like you can practice. So you can literally practice like uh, touching and then retouching. And then you can look at the spot and you can have them record it. Or what you can do is, yeah, ISOs uh, actually help a lot. Um, And so you can also uh, do ISOs. And I'm not talking like yielding. You're going to have to go maximum contract and then find a position where you have to access those muscle ranges that might not be activating. Mm -hmm. And so um, additionally, what you can do is you can teach them new movements. Um, So if you have no idea where you are in space in these areas, um, you're going to have to learn pretty quick in order to learn a new skill. And so this is um, just like stuff that I've experienced. Uh, other people might have experienced different things, but that's, those are three methods that I've seen help improve these a lot. So is that, is that why you've been hitting the, like you've been trying to hit that backflip? Is that part of it? I mean, I, I think elite athletes do backflips. <laughs> I don't know. I just <laughs> I, wanted I, to I do a backflip. <clears throat> Bro, it's just like, like I like I'm I don't want to do a backflip because it's dope to do a backflip. Like it it is, but it's just like elite athletes can just do stuff like that. Like I don't know why. It just my buddy, he he jumps 40 inches, like he benches three plates, like it's nothing, and he just does backflips. I'm just like crap, like I don't know how to do a backflip. <laughs> that's that's a very valid point right there. So and it's also fun. It was more fun than anything else I've ever done training wise. The application for the optimal zone thing, like say you were trying to apply this to a bench and you felt like you were stuck at the bottom, like would you basically, how would you apply that like in the weight room? Like, you'd have yeah. pins set or like just explain that to me. Okay. So right now um, I've only been targeting my uh, top range, um, but if I'm caring about my bottom range, yeah, I'm going to go pins or not pins, I'm going to go probably deeper than pins. I'd probably go like a dumbbell sort of action. And mm-hmm. the favorite, everybody's favorite way to do that right now is uh, oscillating ISOs. Actually, I don't know if that's everybody's favorite. That should be everybody's favorite. Um, but what I would do is uh, I'll sh- I literally have an example exercise that's just top range, but we could do a bio range. Like, you know, this, uh, the, uh, the bar that goes that Dean uses, I don't know what it's called, but it goes like up oh, and then down around the low. It's called a yeah. Duffalo bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That bar, you could use that bar too. But I would go, this is literally the here. I'll I'll just move it over. It's fine. Okay. So here I am on bench. Uh, this is three plates. This is just top ROM. Um, but I feel like my top ROM isn't strong enough where it should be my top ROM. So that's why I've been targeting it. Like I feel like I like. I like the top range of motion right now because uh, that's what I feel like gets used way more. Uh, like at ball release, I'm super extended and I feel really weak at ball release, for instance. So I've been doing this exercise. And so what I have up here is I've got bands uh, because I want it to be super heavy where I'm the strongest. And then I want it to be not as, not as heavy, like so I can actually get it up and I get a little assist. And additionally, the bands are going to help me uh, – convert from the technically eccentric even though that's definitely concentric uh, muscle action um because there's a pretension into concentric really really fast so you get so it might yeah. yes exactly and so i'm also gonna get so we haven't talked about this yet but gtos are super important and i'm training my gtos to accept so this is essentially a super max eccentric because i can only get it i only get the rep for one so I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I can only get it for one. And this is technically a super max because I can't get it up. And so the band, I got the band assist on the first rep. So I got the super max on the first rep. It's like a double. And so I'm really, I'm a real big fan of this right now. 
And so I would just do the same thing, but with the duffalo bar, like literally right on the, on the chest and then boom, hit it right up. And so the band assist will assure that you pretty much don't fail. Um, I would have like a buddy to spot you then though, because I don't want to use pins. I don't want it to rest on the pins ever. I want to, I, and I also don't want it to bounce off the chest. And so if you can't get deep enough where you feel like you're still like too strong, you'd be weaker, like an inch down below, I'd go, I go dumbbells. And then I would go, uh, you can, you can rack a band onto a dumbbell. No problem. Like from the top of the rack, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so are you, are you, but you're not pressing it all the way though with the dumbbells, right? Like, what do you? No, I'm just going to where I'm like, if it's a super max load, chances are I'm going to be fine getting it up once I hit, get it to halfway. Uh -huh. Like I'm going to just go where I feel like once the struggle is done, like I'm going to go back down if I can. And then, so wait, can you explain the oscillatory? Iso yeah. So the oscillatory system? isometric, uh, Cal, who invented those Mason? Just uh, Cal Beach, I think. I, I, yeah, I don't know if he invented them, but it's literally just an oscillation, like in an ISO position. So it's just, so, you know, everyone knows max contract ISO. If you contract both sides of the muscle at the same time, uh, it replicates super fast muscle action in sport because you can't contract two sides of the same muscle at the same time, technically. So they're just turning on and off really fast. And so an oscillatory ISO is an attempt to do this with conscious movement. And so it's not like happening because your body can't do it. And so like, for instance, like say, like I've got a shoulder, e, like a shoulder IR ISO, like right here that I'm holding. And so instead of just like contracting both sides of my shoulder, I'm going to go back and forth just quickly as possible okay. right there. And, and so you like can also do that up against resistance. You could do that up against a band on one side to get like an overload eccentric or like an overload concentric band on the other side. And then his thought is like, you get like 20 degrees of transfer to each side of the range of motion. So like, theoretically, you're working almost the whole entire range of motion. Yeah. And so you can do this on bench press. So say you know where your weakest point of bench press is. Like, you know, it's like four inches off your chest. You can lower a bench down to there and do like 15 to 16 reps right in that specific range of motion where you're really, really weak. Yeah, okay. And it helps you target it. So that, yeah, that's what I was picturing with the dumbbells was like just barely... But would yeah. you be able to do that with a – do you even want to do that with, like, a heavy load then? Because I feel like – Yeah, I do. Okay. I want to I wanna practice uh, grabbing, like, a, bu a bunch – as much weight as I possibly could with so an that's, eccentric. That's where the bands could definitely help, too, because it'll yeah, pop Yeah, that's why I'm doing them. That's why I'm doing them banded. Because when you get into lower ROM, it's going to be lighter. Yeah, okay. So then do you do – you, would you do those – to to fatigue or like just are you hitting like a certain amount of reps with like those oscillatory um, isos uh oscillatory isos uh 10 seconds uh it's usually yeah. so you're you're exhausting so the like anaerobic five, threshold. Seven, ten. Okay. yeah so yeah i would start with five seconds and then go all the way up to 10 all right let's see Let's go back. Okay. Is this it? Yeah, I was here. Okay, now we're here. Okay, so this muscles, so this optimal zone of lengthening, I mean, we pretty much covered this. Um, but uh, essentially in sport, we're asked to uh, we're asked to transfer large amounts of force where the muscle uh, looks like this overly stretched or overly shortened position. And so very rarely is it gonna happen where we're in our optimal zones. And so like, when's the, like, so in training, we only train optimal zones right now and we train force production. But if I don't really care about force production, I'd say I don't really, I mean, a little bit, not really. Um, most of the velocity comes from in the delivery capturing momentum. And then, but I want to be able to transfer energy in these two positions. And so I need to practice that. Obviously, that's not just like, well, it is a little bit of a God-given skill. Like, there are guys that can just do it. But some guys really struggle, especially, like, bigger guys, I would say. Like, that throw gas and have to try really hard. Like, this is them. They need to practice. And so I'm going to pair these optimal zones of lengthening, like, with potentially, like, 
these elastic energy like exercises. And that's something that isn't really done. I'd say that everybody's favorite thing to do is med ball throws. But my beef with med ball throws is if somebody can't feel elastic energy transfer in the delivery, I don't know how they're going to feel it in a med ball throw. And I still haven't figured that out why that's everybody's like favorite thing to like go to. Like if I velo med balls, I'm just going to be ingraining the same patterns. So I don't know. And then, uh, yeah. And then conventional lifting doesn't train elastic energy transfer. And then they definitely don't do it in extreme ROM. And you're going to have to do a bunch of stuff in extreme ROM. And that's just missed up, missed out. And so I'm still, so my big idea is, so Kyle Rogers has uh, this thing that he talks about. It's fully lengthened versus fully shortened state of a muscle. And so like for the bicep, uh, the bicep supinates the arm. It, uh, it uh, flexes the elbow and it flexes the shoulder joint. So if he wants it at a fully uh, shortened position, he's going to do like a supinated, uh, an extended supinated like bicep curl. And so that's technically the bicep is already at its shortest state. And so it's going to be overly shortened right there. And so he does like by arm farm like that. And so I need to figure out how to train like the stress shortening cycle right there. And I haven't yet. So that's where I'm going with this eventually. And yeah, I think that's it. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got one more exercise. I got this band assisted overhead press. Um, and so this is the same idea. Uh, this is like 185 and I can only get it up because of the bands at the bottom and I'm a big fan. And so this is partial. I literally went to where my, wherever my weakest range was and I can only get two reps and that was tough. It looks like 225. Is it really? No, but, yeah, it's 185. I wish it was 225. I wish <laughs> I, I was. I was the same thing. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm going to out myself. I'm kind of a baby. <laughs> so why is it like, it just seems like you would think some organizations and stuff would like have caught on to this, you know? Yeah. I mean, so Kyle's starting to do like this stuff in the optimal, like the, the fully lengthened versus fully shortened. And then everybody loves to tr talk about elastic energy. I just don't think they're training as efficiently as they can, right? Like Cal, Cal, talk, Cal does triphasic. Like this is almost triphasic. Like this is a super max eccentric, but with a band assist at the bottom. Like, I think that, I think that just people haven't, I, I don't know. I don't know why it's not done. I, I, I haven't conducted a randomized control trial yet, which I will in order to prove that it works. About it. What about, we can also cut this part out if we end up talking shit about driveline or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what about like, you always hear like, oh, you got like a the skinny athlete that's super wiry. Now we got to get him strong. <laughs> Is that just bullshit? Or like, what? <laughs> oh yeah. Bro, they do that because they don't have anything else to do with them. They're out of ideas. Like that's everybody's favorite thing to do. Like my buddy at junior college through like 92, no effort. Literally none. Like, right? Like, everybody's been with that guy. And then everyone made him put, like, he was convinced by our coaches, by everybody, that something was wrong with him because he didn't lift very much. And he was ruined. He ruined himself. He put on a bunch of weight, got a little fat, and then Velo just went absolutely nowhere. And I was just like, wow. They just had no idea how to train. They don't. They don't sprint him. They don't jump him. And he doesn't like lifting because his body doesn't like it. Like he's not lazy. Like he works hard. He just doesn't like lifting. Yeah, so they so run out of ideas of things to do. We were listening to uh, the Clemson baseball strength coach. He was in the baseball performance summit. And he talks about like his difference between uh, more like skinny wiry guys versus power guys. He noticed the skinny wiry guys tend to be starters because they're like what he calls lower effort guys. And the bigger, stronger guys tend to be like one inning max effort relievers. But in terms of training implications, his like more wiry guys, he almost exclusively does unilateral lifts because he doesn't want to take away their rotational capabilities, um, like heavy bilateral lifts or really anything heavy on the spine compresses you. And then you lose some ability to rotate your T-spine and your pelvis. And so 
he really tries to stay away from that. And then it's like knowing if the guy throws 95, like, and you got four years in pro ball, five years before, like you get released or you're in triple A or the big leagues, like you got a lot of time. So the number one goal is to stay healthy and to keep moving well, like not to necessarily chase output for one mile per hour. Like longevity is kind of the name of the game there. So. Yeah. Yeah, that makes oh, sense. Big, big thing here too. Um, because these are partial ranges of motion, you don't get sore. I was about to say um, that, yeah. I feel like you can yeah. do more total volume, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I like this. Like, I would definitely prescribe stuff like this to like a athletic kind of wire guy. Yeah. Um, what about because, like, like yeah. in season too? It's probably easier, right? Yeah. I, I haven't gotten sore yet. And so, um, yeah. And I think my bench has also gone up while I've been doing this. Uh, cool. I have yet to test. What about if you're trying to replicate this for like a posterior chain type deal? Like, uh, how do you? Yeah. I mean, so uh, hinge pull, I mean, squat hinge. So I do, uh, I mean, this is a regular ass squat, like a quarter squat. Um, that's but one of Mason's favorite exercises for I'm, sure. I'm banging like squat and like quarter are like, I'm thinking about like, how do you mimic like a deadlift or an RDL with like the shortened deal? Yeah. Um, so that's a great question. And I will get back to you when I know the answer to that. And I am literally thinking about that. I have been thinking about that for the last week. I mean, I and guess you so, could just you could pull from the blocks, right? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. my my big thing is I'm a really big fan of the quarter squat, though. Like, I I just I am a big fan of it. Um. So because, uh, like, think about like everything that you do, like, is pretty in the delivery is pretty much going to be at the height of that quarter squat. Yeah. Um. And then yeah, I definitely understand. I think that a good thing to do might be like a fully like a like a glute bridge for posterior chain uh there's a way that you could um like you could go heel elevated and then you could go uh feet uh, toes up and then that fully lengthens the hamstring and so i'm thinking that that would be pretty money for that as well yeah so, so about, uh, that's something else that i would do why does like like i don't know if you guys all experience but like when you first started like when I first started doing regular lifting, like I just, I threw like seven miles an hour harder. And I was like, I just got a little bit stronger, blah, blah, blah. Like with okay. that, just great, yeah. great. We're tired. Like, let's, let's do it. Okay. So, uh, for bloodletting in doctors was common for a long, long time, right? They'd cut, they'd cut people and then they'd bleed them. And then some people would get better, right? Like yeah. three, like, let's say, let's say out of 10, let's do a randomized control trial. Let's do two of them. One is the control group where we do nothing. And then the other is the control group where they do bloodletting. Five people get better in the, in the bloodletting group. However, seven get better in the non-bloodletting group, but they didn't do any randomized control trials. So they were just like, oh, bloodletting works. Look at the five people that live. Okay. Yeah. And so you might've gotten better, like in spite of those, and I'm not saying like, you, you could have done anything and gotten better, or you could have done nothing and gotten better as well. It might be that at that time, you, it just elicited a hormone response yeah, that you had never that. gotten before. Yeah. yeah. And your body just responded. Or it's the law of initial values, right? You had done nothing before and then you did something. So you were going to get better doing anything. Yeah. I think it was definitely emotional too, because you start to get more confidence and then you're like, I can throw harder. I feel mm -hmm. stronger, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's an emotional, spiritual experience. And then, like, the negative effects of what I would say are the negative effects of lifting, they take a while to hit. Like, for someone to become really compressed, you know, it takes years of lifting. And so you don't get the negative effects, but you do get, like, the increased muscle mass, the increased rate of force development. Like, you get the positives, so. Yeah, you get the positives quicker than the negatives. So mm -hmm. you can counteract that compression type stuff by you know doing all these outside like spinal flexion side bends all that other type stuff right i mean to an extent it's not like yeah it's a, it depends i think for you yes uh, you're like a lot more wiry but for me like no i can't move for shit now like i've been lifting heavy for too long and really no matter how many hangs like how much spine should i do like i'm very compressed i struggle to rotate so and then some guys are obviously just built like that 
Like there's nothing that you can right. do. I mean, genetics are a big part in that. Like I was going to be built stockier and better at lifting, but. I mean, my big thing is you don't want to become compressed. Well, run and move fast a whole bunch and you probably. Yeah. Let me look at find any other. So do you ever like have a, in this thought process, are you just banging like a regular like bench press or does that have any place in the program? I mean, so let's, let's talk about Liam because I like talking about Liam because he throws gas. But I mean, I tell him to do this stuff and then at the end he's, he just hits like a heavy ass single just because he feels good. Like that's fine. I'm not saying that it's bad. Like I'm just saying that we could be doing stuff that helps us more. But I'm going to have his main thing be partial. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm back and forth on this. Uh, Kyle Rogers, like, he's big on the end ranges and the short ranges. So, pec fly is probably his main chest exercise right now. But he still benches. Um, you know, he thinks strength in the pecs is important, and that's, like, the best lift to chase output on. I think it's good to have in. I just wouldn't rely on it, like – twice you know like two times a week bench i don't think you need that but at the I'm same sure. time if benching a lot like makes you happy and like you like benching that's like that's fine too like that's a good enough reason for me like if that's what you need to like feel good at the end of your lift and feel like you got a good pump like that might be more important than okay. stuff like this like this isn't the end all be all it's just like another tool yeah hey, I'm, I'm interested because it's like a weird tactful thing Cause I'm, once I get back into pro ball this year, like I'm going to have, you know, my program and it's not going to be like this stuff. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting, like trying to, uh, but I think once I get onto the affiliates more so, and I'm away from the web of like the central complex, I might just be able to like, if it's like they give me front squat, I can just hit like a quarter squat and be like, <laughs> just be like, yeah. And they might just leave me alone, you know? Yeah. I mean, who knows? It's like, like a lot of those guys, like, just like to, they've gotten to pro ball. And so they walk around and they're everybody's boss because they've gotten there. Yeah. You got anything else, Ronan? Nah, dude, I was honestly just really trying to take a lot of stuff in. Yeah, I took a few screenshots. I like that. Yeah, I have some notes that I took down, so. That, uh. I forget. Was it, did you have the six things that you were reading? Yeah. I think it was six, right? Clayton. Yeah. 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 yeah that slide was, uh, I fucked with that slide. I took a screenshot, bro. I don't know why Drew told me he's sick and then he's throwing live the next day. <laughs> did you see that? <laughs> no, I didn't. I like look on his story. He's like live AVs. I was like, bro, what? <laughs> I that was yeah. Funny. So you guys are training with Dak. Yeah, I've been I've been rehabbing with Dak since uh, April. I got uh, UCL with uh, internal brace. Um, yep, that's what Liam so, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been hammering that shit out with him. Um, well, so I came I came across this page like last not this past fall, but the first fall I got down to CF, um, and then trained with him over the christmas break like thanksgiving christmas break and then got to what maybe like 10 innings and then i ended up tearing tearing my ucl and then like as soon as i found out i toured i just hit him up i'm like hey like let's let's get after it so i've been working with him since that's sick yeah yeah liam liam retore his internal brace and then really yeah hasn't gotten surgery yet hilarious yeah dude i honestly like it, knowing what i know now i 1000 percent would not have gotten surgery but it's whatever so, does he does he not experience symptoms no nah, he's good yeah that's tight. that's that's fucking awesome that's i know it so makes me fire. so happy no that's so fucking fire i'm with Bro, uh yeah. you guys all fall so i'm training with ben baggett right now and yeah uh, sure. Ian walsh um dude something that they turn me on to that i've like the pre-throw med ball, like the elastic bounce throw. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Those are money, bro. Like if I had to choose between that and plyos, like I would almost like take that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. 
I mean, I can actually feel like a stretch through my pack that I can't feel during play. So, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely. Yeah, Ian's a big Dodger now. Holy crap, dude! Yeah, Bro, this shit's insane. Like, like imagine like I just feel like some of the other orgs would look at that guy's page and be like, "This guy's a fucking idiot." Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. Him and him and Ben are just best friends with Ronnie, and I definitely think that that's how he probably got the job ronnie just loves him and then all the other guys like ronnie was just like dude this guy's a genius and then everyone else was just like well rob you're a genius too so you can't like we'll fucking iron <laughs> bro the dodgers yeah like they're like if they get up so i hit up ben right after i was like dude are you gonna take a pro job and then he goes i'm actually trying to get signed like <laughs> because did you Damn. see his did you see his most recent pen yeah he's dude, 95 he's ever played with were the ones that literally just don't give a single fuck about anything. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks volumes because like, yeah. I don't know, like, <laughs> I, I don't know what it is exactly, but there there's, that's just been something that's been consistent with like those kids that I've played with, like that literally don't care at all. And like, they just ball out all the time. And you're like, well, how the fuck does that happen? Cause they're like, they don't do anything. Like they don't give a shit about like their nutrition, like other shit like that. And it's like, I'm over here, like, trying to, like, you know, put in the time and, you know, harness, you know, my, like, the small things. And it's just, like, that dude's over there just literally not giving a single shit. And he's just over there balling. So, like, I feel like that's just, like, not giving a fuck is kind of also a, a, well, an dude, aspect that might be under remember, appreciated. Remember <laughs> fucking, remember Flama? The fuck happened to Flama? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that. He, he, my favorite thing about Flom is he was obsessed that he threw the six harder than the five. And then, like, six months after he posts about that, fucking driveline comes out and says, yeah, the guns were just reading him wrong. And I was just like, oh, Flom. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, he, like, so I was talking to Peter. Uh, I don't know how you say his last name. Bayer. Is that how you say his last name? Bayer. Yeah. Bayer. yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Um, and he told me, like, Flom is, like, still, like, just, like, doing real estate or something. But because you know how he, like, fell off the face of the earth, like, on social media? Like, he just never mm-hmm. posts anything anymore? Dude, he used to post some fire though, like that the throw yeah. angry like hype videos. <laughs> Bro, that's hilarious. Dude, I met that's... that guy like seven years ago. Holy shit! Yeah, that's just crazy. What is this? So I'm on your Instagram right now. Like, what the hell was that? Uh, that shit where you're covering his eye and you're like, right. oh, all right, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's a good like, question. We're... I was just looking at that too. <laughs> so we're so visual calibration. Um, so Mason can't track visually um, very well. And so we're attempting to calibrate and figure out what's wrong with his like eyesight. And so uh, we're covering up his good eye. And so we're making his bad eye like calibrate and attempt to track. And so you're, we're actually doing visual training because there's uh, like four muscles around the eye that actually uh, move the eye. And so if you can't like track, it might be also a cranial nerve problem. And so uh, I forget the exact cranial nerve, sorry boys, but um, it might also be a cranial nerve problem or a potentially vestibular problem. Um, And so we're attempting to figure out what it is right there. And so uh, sensory input uh, creates motor output. And so if you can't see and you're attempting to throw a strike and I can't see like the strike zone on my right eye, that might be an issue. I'm a lefty, so I, it's my right eye. It's not everyone else's. Yeah, if you listen to anything by Dan Fichter, like, he'll go into it and explain it a lot better than us. Um, yeah. But, like, this is the neurology realm, so Chase, think, like, stuff Terry does, but on steroids, like, there's a lot more, uh, like, when you calibrate vision, if it holds for even five steps, like, your body's going to identify that there's a better pattern which then helps it like transfer over whereas like a PRI breathing drill. It doesn't really do anything after you do it. So well, think about like, this for a second. I mean, if you run on, if you run on sand, you're going to run a lot differently than if you run on concrete. Right. And so your body, like how your butt, like how your feet, your feet are receiving sensory input when you do both of those things. Right. And so your body's going to naturally know what to do. Well, imagine if you can't see the freaking ground at all. Like you're running with your eyes closed. Your form is going to be whack. And so if you can't see the ground while you're running, like you got issues. 
And so if Mason can't see a part of the ground where his right foot is going every time he strikes the ground when he's running, he's going to run weird. And he does run weird. Wait, you remember <laughs> that. Um, I don't think we have a video, but like one side was way different than the other. Yeah, actually, I might. Give me two seconds. So but, there's, there's room to like improve command if you can train your non-dominant eye, essentially. I mean, if so, if you're done, if you're I like I'm probably left eye dominant. If my right eye can't see, that might be an issue for throwing strikes. I mean, like your sensory systems uh, change kind of how you move. So think feet and eyes mainly. And so like if you change how they receive signals, you will move differently and probably more efficiently because like that's the more proprioception. So, yeah. What a, are you training? At, are you a, or you're a trainer at Driveline in Washington or Arizona? Yeah, driveline in Washington, but I'm going back to school. So I'm just there for a few weeks right now, and then I'll be there this summer. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a, he's the academy coach. Yeah, like the ATMU coach thing. Did you guys – what about that team that played at Oregon State this summer? <laughs> the fucking summer team. <laughs> I heard they were really bad. I don't, it was like I don't know Eric Sim team. was, like, catching. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're all cloud chasing. It's... And then it was like Max Gordon was the coach or some shit like that. Yeah, they're in the West. Yeah, they're playing the West Coast League teams. But I heard they're just terrible. 